Hello, everybody, and welcome into the Bible Reading Podcast, episode number 299. Today's big Bible question, how can we impress people who don't believe in the God of the Bible? And also, we're going to talk a little bit about how was Daniel rescued from the lion's den. So happy Wednesday, friends. Let's open with a couple of great listener feedback comments from our old friend, Where What Huh? Uh, This was a comment on episode 296. He says, It seems to often shock non-Christians that even a vile sinner can be saved from God's judgment. It seems to be based on the idea that, sinner though I might be, I am at least better than that ungodly Samaritan over there, and thus should be judged kindly. Just today, I was reading the parable of the servant who, forgiven an unimaginably huge debt, still had the audacity to demand a small sum from his own debtors with threats of judgment and torment. In the same way, wishing not to be judged, we judge others and hold them unforgivable. If only we understood how great a debt we have been forgiven and could see the pettiness of the debts we are owed. From episode 298, WWH writes, Something I noticed about the Daniel 5 passage, when Daniel in a interpreted the vision of the tree to Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel said, Let this not happen to you, but to your enemies. With Belshazzar, Daniel is less friendly and declines the rewards. It makes one think of Abraham's remarks to the king of Sodom about, Lest you say, I have made Abram rich, when Abram turned down any help and rewards from the king of Sodom. Daniel, in an earthly environment, was friendly towards Nebuchadnezzar, who eventually acknowledged God while refusing to accept anything from Belshazzar. Abraham, in a possibly not entirely earthly sense, was friendly to the king of Salem and received his blessing, but declined the rewards offered by the king of Sodom. Does this highlight the difference between Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, or is it merely an example of godly discernment on the part of the prophet? Excellent observations, both of them, my friend. I appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate the focus on a focus away from judgmentalism and t- towards forgiveness. And that's quite a, uh, a, a well spotted observation about the way that Daniel interacted differently with Belshazzar and King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, respectful to both of them, but I think you're absolutely right. He was friendly and uh, really kind to Nebuchadnezzar and probably served Belshazzar from a difference. I note here that the Bible doesn't always spell everything out for us clearly. Some truths are subtle, some details are hidden but important. For instance, the Bible doesn't directly tell us the foibles and dangers of polygamy in the Old Testament, but shows us time and time again the folly that comes from it. Thank you for those comments and the interaction. If you want to interact with the show, ask a question, make a comment or something like that, you can go to our YouTube channel, which is Chase Thompson AL, or better yet, come to our BibleReadingPodcast.com website. Either one of those is fine, BibleReadingPodcast.com, or catch us on our YouTube page or comment wherever you get the podcast and you're able to comment. Our readings for today include 2 Kings chapter 2, Psalms 112 and 113, Daniel chapter 6, and 2 Thessalonians 2. I'd love to talk today about who the man of lawlessness is, but we already covered that in episode 104. You, of course, can find that at our website, BibleReadingPodcast.com. I'm also quite tempted to discuss a different sort of big mystery in the Thessalonians passage, or the 2 Thessalonians passage, Who is restraining the man of lawlessness? Unfortunately, there would probably be a bit too much conjecture in that discussion, and I don't think there's enough solid and biblical evidence as to who is restraining the man of lawlessness, so I think I'd better pass on that. I do believe the answer is the Holy Spirit, perhaps a mighty angel, but I honestly am not sure how to go about making a big case for that from the Word of God, though I have seen a few attempt to do so, and there's definitely some biblical evidence in there, just not quite enough to build maybe a whole episode on. Instead, we will spend our seventh straight day focusing on an Old Testament passage, which I am quite sure is a record of some sort. Today, Daniel's sixth reading features an iconic 
Bible story, almost certainly one of the most top five most well-known Bible stories out there. And of course, I'm talking about Archibald in the Rabbit Warren. Oh, okay, actually, no. We're talking today about Daniel in the Lion's Den, which is at least a hundred times better than the Rabbit story. I do want to briefly mention and marvel at God's rescue of Daniel, but our big question of the, in the Bible today is instead focused on a slightly different aspect of the same story, and that is the reaction of Darius, the pagan king of the Persians and Medes, to Daniel. So here's the story in a nutshell, if you've never heard it. We're going to wait, read it in a second, but here's a summary. Daniel rises to a high rank in the kingdom of Darius, uh, or Darius if you prefer, and the others are jealous of him and plot against him, ultimately tricking Darius into signing a law that will condemn Daniel for praying to God. Daniel, of course, keeps praying to God, so Darius is forced to allow Daniel to be put into the lion's den for his execution. Not only does Darius feel terrible about this, but he actually stays up all night fasting, avoiding sleep, no entertainment, no nothing. He's just restless and worried about Daniel. And, and interestingly, we know more about what happened with Darius that night than we do about what happened to Daniel in the lion's den. That's kind of interesting. Anyway, in the morning, he runs to the lion's den, hoping against hope that God had delivered Daniel. And we, when he finds out that Daniel has indeed been saved, he's like overjoyed. And that brings us to our big question of the day. Why? Why does this king, Darius, care so much about this Daniel guy? You know, think about it. Daniel was from another country, another religion, totally different social class and ethnic group. You know, so many differences between the two of them. How could Darius care so much about this guy? And the answer to that question is important for us who are followers of Jesus as we seek to fulfill the Great Commission and share the good news with the world. Because the way that Daniel acted gives us a good blueprint, actually a great blueprint, for how we should act as followers of Jesus particularly those of us who have some sort of secular job, some sort of job that's not in a church setting, for instance, or in a strictly Christian setting. So let's read Daniel 6 and see if you can spot how it is that Darius became so enamored with Daniel. Daniel chapter 6, verse 1 in the Christian Standard Bible. Darius decided to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom stationed throughout the realm, and over them three administrators, including Daniel. These satraps would be accountable to them so that the king would not be defrauded. Daniel distinguished himself above the administrators and satraps because he had an extraordinary spirit, so the king planned to set him over the whole realm. The administrators and satraps, therefore, kept trying to find a charge against Daniel regarding the kingdom, but they could find no charge or corruption, for he was trustworthy and no negligence or corruption was found in him. Then these men said, We will never find any charge against this Daniel unless we find something against him concerning the law of his God. So the administrators and satraps went together to the king and said to him, May King Darius live forever. All the administrations, uh, administrators of the kingdom, the prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an edict that, for thirty days, anyone who petitions any god or man except you, the king, will be thrown into the lion's den. Therefore, your majesty, establish the edict and sign the document so that, as a law of the Medes and Persians, it is irrevocable and cannot be changed. So King Darius signed the written edict. When Daniel learned that the document had been signed, he went to his house. The windows in its upstairs room opened toward Jerusalem, and three times a day he got down on his knees, prayed, and gave thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel petitioning and imploring his God, so they approached the king and asked about his edict. Didn't you sign an edict that for thirty days any person who petitions any god or man except you, the king, will be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, As a law of the Medes and Persians, the order stands and is irrevocable. Then they replied to the king, Daniel, one of the Judean exiles, has ignored you, the king, and the edict you signed, for he prays three times a day. 
As soon as the king heard this, he was very displeased. He set his mind on rescuing Daniel and made every effort until sundown to deliver him. Then these men went together to the king and said to him, You know, your majesty, that if it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no edict or ordinance the king establishes can be changed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you continually serve, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and the signet rings of his nobles, so that nothing in regard to Daniel could be changed. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he reached the den, he cried out in anguish to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, the king said, has your God, whom you continually serve, been able to rescue you from the lions? Then Daniel spoke with the king, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they haven't harmed me, for I was found innocent before him and also before you, your majesty. I have not done harm. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to take Daniel out of the den. When Daniel was brought up from the den, he was found to be unharmed, for he trusted in his God. The king then gave the command, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and thrown into the lion's den, they, their children, and their wives. They had not reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Then King Darius wrote to those of every people, nation, and language who live on the whole earth, May your prosperity abound. I issue a decree that in all of my royal dominion people must tremble in fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed, and his dominion has no end. He rescues and delivers, he performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth, for he has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So that's a great story, a great historical event. And we see there Daniel was absolutely above reproach, full of integrity, but also humble, hardworking and excellent at all of his jobs. He was reliable. He was effective and conscientious. And you just have to read the the description of him in Daniel 6, 3, and 4. He distinguished himself among the administrators and satraps because he had an extraordinary spirit. They tried to find something to charge him with, but they couldn't because he was trustworthy and no negligence or corruption was found in him. So that's a fantastic testimony. He had an extraordinary spirit and attitude about him. He was absolutely trustworthy, above corruption, no bribes, nothing. Not only that, he wasn't negligent about any aspect of his job. See how this kind of behavior was a tremendous witness to the Medes and Persians? How should we Christians be as workers? I would say that Daniel gives us quite a great example, maybe as good an example as anybody in Scripture, and see how it caught the attention of King Darius when he went to the lion's den to check on Daniel. This is what happened in Daniel 6 verse 20. When he reached the den, he cried out in anguish to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, the king said, has your God, whom you continually serve, been able to rescue you from the lions? Of course, that's how he sounded. We have a recording of him somewhere, right? Kind of a British accent, actually kind of an American accent trying to do a British accent very poorly. That's how Darius sounded. Anyway, did did Daniel keep his head down? and act like a secret agent follower of God? No, absolutely not. Daniel was a very obvious follower of Yahweh, and even the ultimate boss knew it, calling Daniel a servant of the living God and noting that he constantly served God. So what do we learn from that? Well, we learn you can be an amazing worker at your job and also constantly serve God at your job. Just be sure to nail the amazing worker part. Be diligent like Daniel, humble like Daniel, have a great attitude like Daniel, be above corruption like Daniel, be absolutely trustworthy like Daniel, work hard like Daniel, and be honest in a kind way like Daniel was. Daniel shows us 
how to be a witness for God, especially in a secular workplace. Perhaps you've heard of that old quote that is tossed around so often, supposedly said by Francis of Azizi, preach the gospel at all times, if necessary, use words. First, that quote was never said by Francis of Assisi. I don't know who said it. It's made up by somebody. Second, it makes no sense whatsoever. The gospel is a message in words that must be communicated. There's no way around that. And third, I think the Daniel method of evangelism is far superior to the fake Francis of Assisi method of evangelism. Be an excellent worker with a great attitude, diligence, and integrity. Be an obvious asset to your job or boss or whatever, and also be an obvious follower of Jesus. When you do that, perhaps your boss will marvel at the God who empowers you and leads you in being such a good asset to your organization. I don't know, maybe even he will praise God like the pagan king Darius did. Remember what Darius said. He said, I issue a decree in my royal t- dominion that people must tremble in fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed and his dominion has no end. He rescues and delivers. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth, for he has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. I mean, what a testimony from this pagan guy. Did he convert to be a follower of Daniel's God? Well, you know, I don't know about that. But here he is proclaiming the good news about the God of Israel, the God of the Bible. And it's all because Daniel was a fantastic worker and also a very obvious follower of God. So one more thing. How did God deliver Daniel from the lions? And the interesting thing is that Despite this being one of the most well-known Bible stories ever, there is almost zero written here about Daniel's time actually in the lion's den. In fact, there isn't a single description of Daniel's time in the den except for his reply to the king when the whole ordeal was over. We read in verse 21, Then Daniel spoke with the king, May the king live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they haven't harmed me for I was found innocent before him. So did Daniel pray? Did the lions try to attack? Did the angel stand between Daniel and the lions? Did he like physically hold the mouths of the lions shut with his hands? Well, we honestly have no idea and no description beyond verse 22 about what happened. We just know God sent his angel and the lion's mouths were shut by the angel. End of the story. Wouldn't you like to see some hidden camera footage of all of that happening? Because I totally sure would. Well, we don't have that. That's too bad. But we do have our passage in 2 Kings chapter 2, and this is an awesome read. So we're going to read this. We're going to see Elijah taken up in the whirlwind and Elisha inheriting a double portion of Elijah's spirit. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1, The time had come for the Lord to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elijah and Elisha were traveling from Gilgal, and Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, the Lord is sending me on to Bethel. But Elisha replied, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Then the sons of the prophets who were with it at Bethel came out to Elisha and said, Do you know that the Lord will take your master away from you today? And he said, Yes, I know. Be quiet. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here. The Lord is sending me to Jericho. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. Then the sons of the prophets who were in Jericho came up to Elisha and said, Do you know that the Lord will take your master away from you today? And he said, Yes, I know. Be quiet. Elijah said to him, Stay here, the Lord is sending me to the Jordan. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men from the sons of the prophets came and stood facing them from a distance while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the waters which parted to the right and the left. Then the two of them crossed over on dry ground. After they had crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I can do for you before I am taken from you. So Elisha answered, Please let me inherit two shares of your spirit. Elijah replied, You have asked for something difficult. If you see me being taken from you, you will have it. If not, you won't. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire with horses of fire suddenly appeared and separated the two of them. Then Elijah went up into the heavens in the whirlwind. As Elisha watched, he kept crying out, My father, my father! 
the chariots of and horsemen of Israel. Then he never saw Elijah again. He took hold of his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. Elisha picked up the mantle that had fallen off of Elijah and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle Elijah had dropped and struck the waters. Where is the Lord God of Elijah, he asked. He struck the waters himself, and they parted to the right and the left, and Elisha crossed over. When the sons of the prophets from Jericho, who were facing him, saw him, they said, "Ah, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. Then they came to meet him and bowed down to the ground in front of him. Then the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, Since there are fifty strong men here with your servants, please let them go and search for your master. Maybe the Spirit of the Lord has carried him away and put him on one of the mountains or into one of the valleys. And he answered, Don't send them. However, they urged him to the point of embarrassment, so he said, Send them. They sent fifty men who looked for three days but did not find him. When they returned to him in Jericho, where he was staying, he said to them, Didn't I tell you not to go? Then the men of the city said to Elisha, Even though our Lord can see that the city's location is good, the water is bad and the land is unfruitful. And he replied, Bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. After they had brought him one, Elisha went out to the spring of water, threw salt in it, and said, This is what the Lord says, I have healed this water. No longer will death or unfruitfulness result from it. Therefore the water remains healthy to this very day, according to the word that Elisha spoke. From there, Elisha went up to Bethel. As he was walking up the path, some small boys came out of the city and harassed him, chanting, Go up, Baldy! Go up, Baldy! He turned around, looked at them, and cursed them in the name of the Lord. Then two female bears came out of the woods and mauled forty-two of them, the children. From there, Elisha went to Mount Carmel, and then he returned to Samaria. Hmm. Some questions about that passage, huh? But we continue. Psalm 112, verse 1. Hallelujah. Happy is the person who fears the Lord, taking great delight in his commands. His descendants will be powerful in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Light shines in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, compassionate, and righteous. Good will come to the one who lends generously and conducts his business fairly. He will never be shaken. The righteous one will be remembered forever. He will not fear bad news. His heart is confident, trusting in the Lord. His heart is assured. He will not fear. In the end, he will look in triumph on his foes. He distributes freely to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn will be exalted in honor. The wicked one will see it and be angry. He will gnash his teeth in despair. The desire of the wicked leads to ruin. Psalm 113 verse 1. Hallelujah. Give praise, servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be blessed both now and forever. From the rising of the sun to its setting, let the name of the Lord be praised. The Lord is exalted above all the nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one enthroned on high? Who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the trash heap in order to seat them with nobles, With the nobles of his people, he gives the childless woman a household, making her the joyful mother of children. Hallelujah. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be easily upset or troubled either by a prophecy or by a message or by a letter supposedly from us alleging that the day of the Lord has come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he sits in God's temple proclaiming that he himself is God. Don't you remember that when I was still with you, I used to tell you about this and you know what currently restrains him so that he will be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, but the one now restraining will do so until he is out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed. The Lord Jesus will destroy him with the breath of his mouth and will bring him to nothing at the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is based on Satan's working, with every kind of miracle, both signs and wonders, serving the lie, and with every wicked deception among those who are perishing. They perish because they did not accept the love of the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a strong delusion so that they will believe the lie, 
so that all will be condemned, those who do not believe the truth but delighted in unrighteousness. But we ought to thank God always for you, brothers and sisters loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God has chosen you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel so that you might obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold to the traditions you were taught, whether by what we said or what we wrote. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who has loved us and given us eternal encouragement and good hope by grace encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good work and word. Amen. May he indeed do that to you, friends. Good day and Godspeed.